Hello, if you're watching right now, we're just getting set up a little early so that make sure everything is working well. If you have any questions, you can add them to the chat and then I'll answer them during a little break and towards the end of the class. Welcome, happy Saturday.
Little Bird Park from North Park Brinko. Only 4.7% alcohol, so it's like having tea in the morning. Howdy, good morning. As we go, as we get started, probably in about five to 10 minutes. If you have any questions that come up, you can type them in the chat and then I'll answer them either as they come up or um, like during little breaks so that we can make sure everything gets, gets answered for everybody. But welcome, good morning, glad you're here. It's my first YouTube live class, so that's pretty exciting. So hopefully all the all the kinks are working out for you. If anything pops up, let me know. Cheers. Cheers, Jared.
All right, so we'll get started pretty soon. In about, we'll give everyone about five minutes just to catch up. So uh, get comfy. We should All take right, about. So we'll get started pretty soon. <laughs> uh, so we'll give everyone about five minutes. Yep. There's audio test check. <laughs> so uh, we'll give everyone a few minutes to get in there, and um, we will uh, get through about 40 slides just on the basics of brewing. And uh, welcome to my, my dining room here. You can see this wall piece, enjoy it. And uh, we will uh, have a little break about halfway through where I'll look at any questions that are added to the chat window uh, and I'll, I'll make sure that I answer those. So you can, if any questions come up or if you need clarification as I go, feel free to type in there and then I will, um, I'll make sure I address everything that comes up in the chat window um, uh, during the break or towards the end, and then I'll we'll definitely have a little time at the end to uh, just type and answer questions and uh, and go from there. But it's 11 right now, so we'll give it a few more minutes before we really dive in. And I'm glad you're here, hanging out with me in my living room. I can't see you, but cheers to you all. If you don't have a beer or a coffee or tea or something, this would probably be a good time to grab it. If you're just checking in, welcome. We'll get started with the brew class in about, we'll give it about another four or five minutes. And uh, any if there's any topics that you want to make sure I cover this, uh, then then feel free to leave them in the in the chat. If it's something that I feel is kind of out of scope or or too far, I'll I'll, I'll be happy to give a quick short answer, and then maybe we can follow up later, one on one, or or I can uh, use it for another topic for a, a video down the road. Uh, so feel feel free to leave any sort of comment or or feedback in the comment window, and uh, I'll be happy to to either answer it right away or or uh, fit it in where we can. And yeah, and on that note, if there's any topics that you would like either a live stream on or uh, just like a, a general how-to, then feel free to, to leave that in the comments or shoot us an email. You can email us at brew at homebrewingco.com. I'll type that in the in the chat there. Cheers, Marco. This could quickly turn into a good drunk game. Just every time someone cheers me, I'll just I'll just go for that. We'll see how far we get through this class.
All right. Good morning. It's about 11.05 ish. So we'll get started. Let's move this over for you guys a little bit. We'll come say hello over here. All right. Uh, good morning. Welcome. Glad you're all here. First of all, and again, cheers. Happy Learn to Homebrew. This is the National Learn to Homebrew Day. If you're not familiar with the American Homebrewers Association or the AHA, uh, then I highly recommend that you check them out. Just uh, go to your favorite search engine, type in American Homebrewers Association, go to their website. If you're not a member already, I, I really suggest that you, you do sign up. It's 25-ish bucks a year. You get a magazine. You get access to all their online resources. Uh, and they're, they are literally the organization that's been around for about 30, 40 years that have been making, um, how should I say this? They've, they've been the advocate for homebrew as a hobby uh, throughout the United States and the world. Uh, in some cases, literally being the ones to advocate um, legislative change to make homebrewing legal in all 50 states. Uh, it sounds crazy to say that that was actually a thing that had to happen, but, but it actually was something that happened. So it's an organization that uh, deserves your support uh, now and throughout the future just, just for the work that they've already done for the hobby. And uh, they're the ones who organize the National Homebrewers Convention every year and the National Homebrew Competition at the same time. And uh, they're just a great resource, and uh, they've definitely been hit this year because it's attached to the same organization uh, that organizes for GABF and the Craft Brewers Conference. So the, the homebrew arm and the professional arm of the AHA slash Brewers Association uh, weren't able to do all of their main in-person events this year, and those usually attract tens of thousands of people. So um, one way you can support them right now is just by becoming a member of the American Homebrewers Association and the benefits you get from them alone will be, uh, will be well worth the, uh, the 25 to 30 bucks or so that you're going to spend. So I really recommend going uh, to the American Homebrewers Association website and taking a look. Uh, like I said, they are the ones who organize the uh, national Learn to Homebrew Day, so that uh, was sort of the the uh, the fire that uh, or the kick in the pants that made us want to um, do our our first live stream and uh, first brew class since since March this year. So um, happy to get started with that and get, and get back in this routine. So welcome. We're going to do our intro to brewing class and uh, this is a class that we do via slides with a lot of images. Our goal, um, I'll get into that pretty soon, but uh, I guess actually I should just start because uh, that's basically the next slide, so here we go. Uh, so our goals are to go through the key concepts uh, and terms and we're going to get to know the ingredients. We'll go through the basic process. I'll uh, evangelize here and there, but I'll try to keep it short. Uh, I'd like to keep this uh, to within 45 to 60 minutes, but uh, anyone who's uh, witnessed me do this in person knows that I like to go off on little tangents here and there. So I'll do my best. Uh, and if you have any questions or if I um, don't speak clearly enough on a term or you want a little more clarification on anything, feel free to leave it in the chat and then I'll, I'll address it uh, at certain points throughout the, the course. Um, or I'll make sure at the end that we can go over everything, and uh, and then we can always we always have the ability to, to chat one on one offline as well. So, um, all right. So uh, my name is George Thornton. I am the the founder of Home Brewing Co. and the Home Brewer, and uh, we've been doing this for almost nine years in North Park, San Diego, and uh, talking now in November of 2020. So uh, happy to happy to be a part of the homebrew scene and. Uh, happy to be here today to talk about beer. So, what is a brewer? A brewer is someone who produces wort in their brew house for the purpose of fermentation. Uh, I got a picture of 
good old Barack Obama there, who was the first president to make homebrew in the White House kitchen. And you can actually uh, look for the recipes they made. I believe there's a honey ale and a, a porter uh, that are worth checking out and, and brewing yourself. So uh, why is brewing so cool? Why do we get so obsessed with this hobby? Uh, I, I can't speak for everybody, but I know for me, the, one of the things I love about it is that you get to wear a lot of hats. I think it accesses a lot of parts of your brain. Uh, on the one hand, it's uh, a good medium for learning more about scientific, uh, not only methods, but um, practices. So uh, the, the biology of yeast and the chemistry of the water uh, all play a role, and uh, beer is a great way to learn more about those aspects in general. You definitely get to think about flavors and uh, whether they're kind of like classic flavors and what does a classic English bitter taste like, or what are some new cool fun flavors I can do with beer. Uh, you also have to do a lot of tactical hands-on work. That's where the kind of janitorial aspect comes in. I, I could also add engineer uh, to this list. Uh, and then I think we all kind of think we're sex gods, I think. So there's a bit of an ego thing in there too, but it helps us all um, uh, just really enjoy the hobby. It's a hobby that keeps on giving most definitely. I feel like I'm constantly learning with this hobby. After 20 plus years of, of, of home brewing, I'm always learning more. And, there, and I, each time I talk to a new home brewer, uh, even people who have zero experience bring in this new perspective that helps push the hobby further and further. So I, it, I think it's, uh, it's clearly something that's been around since the beginning of civilization and it's gonna, it'll be around till the very end as well. So, I'm going to jump into the ingredients for how we make beer before I go into the process of how beer is actually made. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to give this kind of uh, thousand foot above view of, of how we make beer. Uh, so this is how you make beer in 30 seconds. So if someone's asking you, what, do you make, how do you, what are the steps for making beer? It's this. You steep some grains for 15 to 30 minutes, and then you pull those grains out. So you can see there's a little uh, cotton bag being used there to steep those grains. So essentially you make a tea that we call wort. You need to boil that wort uh, to sanitize it and to um, actually extract some of the bitterness from the hops. So we boil the wort and we add hops, that's step two. And then you need to cool it down and add some yeast. And that's it, that's how you make beer. Uh, that's how it's done every single time, regardless of who you talk to, whether you're a home brewer or a professional brewer, that's the general process. So we're going to break those steps uh, down a lot more and add a little nuances here and there. But if anything ever starts to feel overwhelming or complicated, or if we're going into some of the technical aspects, you can uh, put your mind at ease knowing that brewing beer is and always will be steeping grains, boiling the wort and adding hops, and cooling it down and pitching the yeast. That's it, every time. Okay, so uh, this slide's a little, uh, a little busy, I'll admit, but I want to just break down some of the uh, different terms we'll use. So at the very top, you see we have three columns. There's all extract brewers, partial grain brewers, and all grain brewers. That's kind of a sliding scale of the type of brewing that you might do at home. Uh, and in this case, we're describing the ingredients or the, and or the process you might use to make beer. So all extract brewing is really the, the most simple form. It's using extracts, which are really just condensed wort, um, to uh, be the source of our sugar and our flavor, or in terms of malt flavor, at least. And we can do this at home. You probably have a pot at home that will suffice with, with what you need to do here. So something that can boil about two gallons of liquid. Uh, you're, you'll use your stove, and then you'll need either like a, a food-grade bucket or a glass carboy or something to ferment inside of. But... Generally speaking, that's really all you need. Partial grain brewing adds a little bit more nuance and character to that process by saying, uh, well, before we steep some of our, uh, or before we start boiling our extract, let's steep some of these grains so that we can uh, have a little bit more control over the, um, the, final, the final flavor process, etc. And then all grain brewing essentially says, okay, let's just take that and instead of um, using any of the extracts, which are just condensed warts, like chicken stock kind of comparison, uh, let's just 
use only 100% grain and we're going to extract all the sugars ourselves and all of the flavors from the grains ourselves. Uh, and the process is really easy. It's still basically the same thing. You're going to steep some grains and then you're going to remove the grain somehow. But if you're not using extracts, you just need a lot more equipment, you know, a lot more equipment. You need something that can boil about five gallons of liquid. Uh, so most likely you, your, your household stove won't cut it anymore. So you might need a, like the kind of turkey burner. Uh, and you, you likely need a few extra pieces of equipment because you're going to be steeping now about 10 to 15 pounds of grain on average. So you just need larger vessels. So uh, you have to add on a little bit more pieces of equipment, but, um, but I promise the process is still really easy. So for extract, uh, like I mentioned, you really just need something to boil. You need something to ferment. Uh, and really, the, the, I should point out here, the most important step to get down with making beer at home is having a good process for just sanitizing uh, or cleaning and then sanitizing everything. Uh, and we can also use some measuring tools like a thermometer, hydrometer, that's going to help us um, measure the amount of sugar and then therefore alcohol, which we'll, we'll touch on that later. I listed on here just a few of the kind of add-on things that you might consider. Uh, my goal with this slide and the last slide is just to familiarize you with some terms so that you know when someone says auto siphon, uh, you know, okay, that's something for moving liquid from one place to another. And we'll have some slides on that later. Um, but it's not really to say you have to have that thing. It's just kind of where I would say it's pretty nifty and pretty handy and worth the 20 bucks you'll spend on it. So uh, when I was first getting into homebrew, I definitely thought in terms of how do I, um, how do I convince myself and other people that uh, this is a good idea, a good investment of my money. So I started thinking of it in terms of, well, it cost me about $100 to $200 to do my first batch in terms of equipment and ingredients. Um, so my first batch is only, it's, I'm going to pay about $4 per 12-ounce bottle of beer. Okay, that's decent. That's like going out to a bar and... 2000 and buying a Bud Light, right? Uh, now, subsequent batches, since I already purchased the equipment, are only going to cost me about a dollar per bottle. Now, that's a great deal. I do want to say that you don't really get into home brewing because you're trying to save money. Yes, you can save money with home brewing if that's the only way you make your beer, but uh, I don't want to make the false claim that if you get into home brewing, you're going to save a ton of dough. Th there's certainly ways to do that, and if that's your goal, then I, I can help you. Uh, find the path for that goal, but it will it will involve also stopping going out to go to bars and stuff like that. Um, still, again, I'm happy to discuss that, but I don't want to make the false claim that like you're going to save a ton of money by by doing homebrew. It is a hobby that you spend money on the same way that if you love to surf, you're going to buy surfboards. Uh, so so include that in your budget as something. It's something fun to do, but but there's the general cost breakdown. All right. So uh, the core ingredients, uh, before I move into this, I'm just going to see if you guys have any questions in there. Uh, Jared, good point. Relax, don't worry. Have a homebrew. Uh, and if you're, if you're popping in right now and catching up, don't worry. Uh, we start around 11.05 so everyone have a chance to catch up. And if you have any questions, just type them into the chat and uh, I'll make sure to take a look at them every once in a while. So, All right, here we go. Core ingredients. So uh, to help me remember the core ingredients and what they do, um, I, I'm a fan of analogies and metaphors, so uh, we came up with this one. The core ingredients uh, are kind of like the core founding members of the Beatles. Um, I, we can go into detail about, you know, yeah, there's the other guys before and, and whatnot, but we're going to use malt as John Lennon, hops as George Harrison, yeast as Paul McCartney, and water as Ringo Starr. Now, if you're a huge Beatles fan, uh, which I consider myself uh, to be, You'll, you've maybe heard of the fifth beetle, this uh, character who was always around to sort of help things out, and that's where I think adjuncts come into play. So uh, we'll talk about what adjuncts are. And here we go. So Malt, Malt is uh, like John Lennon, the founder of the band. At least when I started homebrewing, I started thinking of Malt as this thing that I've kind of always heard of. It's uh, the the flavor profiles are pretty familiar, bready, toasty, um, caramel, uh, all those sort of characteristics we can get from, from malt. And it's really like the base and the backbone of, of what a beer is. And it's pretty important, uh, even if we talk about the legal definitions of beer, being that it's uh, a fermented product made from 
uh, barley or wheat or other malted grains. And uh, that's in, in comparison to things like cider, which is made from apple, or wine, which is made from grape, etc. So, um, so malt in that sense really is the sort of the base or the core of the band. John Lennon was the founder of the band. Uh, and the, the thing to look out for here especially is that this, uh, it's the source of fermentable sugar. And without fermentable sugar, we, we really just have a soda. We don't have, uh, if we don't have fermentation, if we don't have sugar, um, we're just creating this um, sweet thing that's not alcoholic, therefore it's not really beer. So what is malt? So you've heard the term malt before, uh, but I think a lot of us use that term. We know it's kind of this thing, but we don't know exactly what it is. How is it made? What makes malt different than barley? What makes malt different than wheat? Well, it turns out that uh, malt is more of a process than it is an actual um, noun, I should say. So uh, malt, and I, and I put here barley seeds, but barley just happens to be the grain that's most commonly used to make beer, but you can malt anything. So uh, the malting process generally looks like this. We have, uh, we have the fact that barley seeds or wheat seeds are packed with potential sugars, but they're really complex. Uh, the seed is there to make a plant, and uh, the seed itself is packed with all of this potential to grow into a plant, so that means it needs some, some kind of simple sugars uh, and some enzymes to break down those sugars to just help the growing process so that once a little root formation starts, then the root can start pulling nutrients from the actual soil. So the seed's job is to uh, have enough energy potential for that seed to grow into a plant. Malting sort of takes advantage of that natural process and uh, leaves those sugars available for brewers to take advantage of in order to feed to yeast, in order to make alcohol, so that we can have beer. So the process of malting a grain is you soak it in some warm water uh, for anywhere, you know, 24-ish hours, and you wait for those uh, that kind of softens up the seed a little bit and it uh, starts activating some of these enzymes in the grain that will allow the grain to, to break down some of those sugars so that it can start using that sugar as a source of food while it starts to grow its roots. The second stage uh, is where we take those, uh, we sort of drain out that water, and then the grains are, here's a photo in the middle of kind of the old school method of where these grains are just laid out on the floor, which we call floor malting, and they're constantly raked so that as the roots start to grow, they don't get stuck together and all matted up. We want to be able to separate them at some point. Uh, and then once we see the rootlet actually start to grow after a few days, uh, we then want to sort of gently put a pause on that growing process. We don't want this to become a plant. Uh, so what that looks like is they take these kernels which are uh, sprouting a little bit and they put them into a kiln and the kiln is using um, some warm air to gently sort of nudge those grains out of the, out of the process of, of converting their, uh, their, their starches into sugars. And the reason why we don't want the grain to do that all the way is we want the brewer to be able to use that uh, sugar or that starch uh, in the brewing process. So this is just, so that's the basic definition of malt. It is a... Uh, a grain that's been germinated or sprouted partially and then dried out so that it stops germinating completely. Now you can do that to barley, rye, quinoa, anything that sprouts you can do this process to and you can you can malt those um, those seeds. Now when it comes to brewing malt uh, we tend to break it up into two main categories. We have base malts on the one side and then we have specialty malts on the other side. So this gets more into the like recipe formulation side of brewing and just kind of understanding the basic, uh, like when you walk into a homebrew store or when you scroll a website with homebrew supplies, uh, what does it mean base malts and what kind of malts am I looking at? There's literally hundreds of varieties in a, in a store sometimes. So what do, I, what do I do with those? What's the point? Uh, base malts are uh, sort of like flour in a loaf of bread. So if you're making a loaf of bread, you go, you buy your all-purpose flour. Uh, Two-row malts would be a good comparison there. And you're going to use a lot of all-purpose flour 
Maybe you'll put a little bit of wheat flour in there as well. Um, maybe a little bit of rye. Those would all be examples of base malts. Um, now, if I want to have a little cinnamon characteristic to that, I don't just take a whole bunch of cinnamon and push it into a loaf shape and then put it in the oven. It's really, I need a whole bunch of flour and then maybe what, a total of one to 2% of the total weight could be cinnamon or uh, garlic or whatever. And that's kind of what, what specialty malts are in a way. So base malts are really um, there to be the, the bulk of the foundation of what a beer is. And these specialty malts are there to be used sort of like um, spices and, and seasoning to help uh, augment the base a little bit so that we can create the whole variety of beer styles that exist in the world. So oh, it's really windy outside. <laughs> so, uh, so you're going to um, see uh, base malts uh, called things like Munich malt or Pilsner malt, Golden Promise, Maris Otter. Some of those are just the names of regions where they developed a kind of distinct way of making their malt. Or uh, like in the, in the case of like Maris Otter or Golden Promise, they're named after the actual species of barley, uh, but they also tend to um, stick to a kind of a tradition for where they were malted, in that case, England and Scotland. Now, uh, specialty malts, we have uh, a huge range of, of examples to use. Uh, here on the slide, we have Crystal 60 and we have US Chocolate. Uh, Crystal 60, um, is a good example of the type of malts that express uh, their color by a number, and that number is 60 in this case. So if we uh, look at the whole scale of what we call the Lavi Bond scale, um, L-O-V-I-B-O-N-D, we can uh, use that to get a kind of a basic idea of what kind of color contribution that grain will, will present to our, our beer recipe. And uh, Crystal 60, also known as Caramel 60, uh, means that the lobby bond is 60. What's that mean? The, the scale kind of goes from like uh, two or three lobby bond all the way up to like 600. The higher you go on that scale, the darker the grains get. So at 60, we expect a little bit of like a soft uh, amber caramel sort of color. Uh, US chocolate uh, is uh, 350 lobby bond. Uh, so we get into that dark brown. And, and then of course, it just depends how much we use, right? So if you're, for instance, if you're cooking and you're using a, a pinch of salt or a pinch of cinnamon, uh, that's a lot different than using a whole handful and, and throwing that in there. So that again gives us a little bit more nuance and, and uh, range for how we make our beers. I, earlier I talked about malt extracts. We were talking about the difference between extract brewers and all grain brewers. So what, what in the world is a malt extract? Uh, the easiest way to, to explain this is a malt extract is just a wort that's made from a base malt that is then dehydrated into either a really thick syrup that we call liquid malt extract or dehydrated even further into a little fine powder that we call dry malt extract. Uh, I know at the beginning of, of brewing and looking up recipes, I used to get confused by this LME and this DME because in addition to having liquid malt extract and dry malt extract, we have a variety of malts that we uh, of extracts we could purchase. So, uh, if we look down here, we have if we're using a base of like two row or pale malts, we call that light or pale or golden light extract, just depending on who makes it. If we're using pilsner malt as the base, we call that extra light or pilsen extract. If we add a little bit of crystal sixty we tend to call that amber extract, or if we're using chocolate malt to make it a little darker, we call that dark extract. Uh, I used to get confused by uh, the idea of buying light DME, and I would think light dark malt extract, well, that's weird. Uh, what, but really that DME, LME stands for whether it's liquid malt extract or dry malt extract. So um, maybe you weren't confused by that, but I certainly was, so I wanted to point that out. Uh, when it comes to choosing between liquid malt extract and dry malt extract, uh, it, it really comes down to freshness in a way. Uh, some people will, will claim that uh, liquid malt extract, if it's fresh, since it hasn't been dried out as much, uh, you might get a, a more pleasant flavor out of it. However, liquid malt extract also uh, tends to oxidize and stale a lot more quickly than dry malt extract. So I tend to lean towards dry malt extract, especially using extra light um, dry malt extract in my recipes uh, so that I can control some of the color, uh, keep it pretty light. And I also tend to shy away from using amber and dark extracts. Just for me, it's a matter of preference. 
if I can use a light malt extract and then steep a little crystal 60 or chocolate malt to achieve the color that I need, I'd rather do that with using fresh grains and, and just steeping some of those grains before. So that's, that's what we call partial extract brewing. Uh, and it, I, I just feel for me, it adds a little bit more um, kind of hands-on experience. So, so that's my preference, but uh, I don't think either is, is wrong or, or better. It really just comes down to sanitation and fermentation in the end. So we'll get there. All right. Uh, so I'm going to check for any notes in the, in the chat yet. Um, like I said, if you have any questions, go ahead and add them to the chat. So I'll keep moving. So hops, uh, George Harrison is the, uh, the kind of hippie, wildish member of the Beatles and hops are a perfect analogy for him because hops are cousins to marijuana and, uh, are therefore just this sort of hippie of the hop family, I guess. Um, so Hops have a lot of uh, roles, and really there's whole books on each of these um, ingredients that are really worth digging into, but um, one of the main things that hops do on, from a culinary perspective is they provide bitterness, which balances out that sweetness of the malt. So even if you don't want to make a hoppy beer, it's important to use at least a little bit of hops so that you balance out some of that sweet flavor, or taste, I should say, of the of the malt and that helps create a perception of a more balanced easy drinking beer so even a beer like a, a belgian wit or a, a german hefeweizen or a german helles where the malt or the spice profile or the yeast profile tends to be the thing that's uh really in the in the for focus or foreground um, they still require hops to just provide a little bit of balance so this would be like adding just a little pinch of salt. You still need something there to um, sort of balance that out. Now, if you're making a hoppy beer, then of course you just use a lot more hops and we'll learn that the type of hops we use and the stages during the boil that we add them will also influence the overall outcome of the, the beer itself. And another bonus, hops are also a natural preservative. Uh, so if we look at the history of why hops became the thing that you add to beer instead of say things like lavender or rosemary, um, or even just citrus peel, which you can get a lot of those same flavors and aromas from, uh, it is because uh, hops just happen to be a natural preservative. So a uh, bonus score, high points for them. So a few terms and uh, things you'll come across, um, things I think are worth knowing. Female hop cones can be used uh, fresh, which is what we call wet hop or harvest. Uh, you'll see a lot of wet hop or harvest beers come out uh, like August, September, or October. And the, this just means that when they're plucked from the farm during harvest time, uh, they are ideally within a span of, say, like zero hours to two days later used in a brew so that you get a lot of this really uh, fresh cut grass, uh, very fresh plucked um, spice or herb sort of characteristic uh, added to the beer. Uh, so you will see those come out um, around the fall time, end of summer. Now, wet hop cones, if they're left uh, on their own, they're just going to mildew and mold. So, excuse me. So we don't really want that to happen because we tend to only have one harvest per year, right? At least per hemisphere. So um, we need to dry them out. Uh, and so you'll see in the middle picture, those are some what we call whole cone or just hop flowers. So you might see that in a recipe. Whole cone and hop uh, flowers tend to have really nice, uh, beautiful, delicate range of, or a wide range of aromas and flavors that I should say range from delicate and soft to the more uh, aggressive um, characteristics. And uh, some people really love using whole hops because they feel like uh, you get like a, a more true, full expression of the hop profile. Uh, but then again, uh, there's a lot of uh, potential for oxidation and staling of those whole hops. So they do tend to then be gently ground up and then pushed into these little pellets uh, so that uh, they can then be added to like a nitrogen or CO2 purged bag and uh, that'll greatly enhance the uh, storage life or the st uh, shelf stability of the pellet hop. So uh, you'll find that most hops uh, that you um, have easy access to or the widest variety of access to will be in the pellet form. Uh, some people like the pellet form because it's a lot more punchy and um, sort of uh, assertive than the whole leaf hop. And part of that is because when these uh, pellets are created, one of the first steps is actually cutting out some of the leaf 
uh, some of these sort of outside uh, portions of the leaf that don't have as high concentration of the, the pollens and the resins that actually provide the, the hop flavor. So you do end up losing some of maybe those kind of more delicate nuances, but you also have something that has more kind of punch, more bang for its buck, ounce to ounce than a whole leaf hop would. So it really just comes down to experimenting and trying new things, playing with different recipes, playing with different type of hop varieties or formats and at different times of the boil. So again, uh, tons of option for variety and nuance there. All right, Paul McCartney, the ladies man. So if you are a fan of the Beatles, uh, uh, John tends to be the more punkish sort of ethos of the band. George tends to write all the hippie, everyone just love uh, one another sort of stuff. And uh, Paul tends to write the um, more uh, sappy love um, kind of ballads. And uh, that's great. What the hell does that have to do with beer? I'll tell you, um, maybe. So uh, yeast, it turns out, is all female. Uh, they, they are asexual. They reproduce by budding. Uh, so since Paul's the ladies' man, I just feel like he's a great fit for uh, being yeast here. Um, that's not a dig. Just saying. So the job of yeast is probably the most important. Uh, very much arguably the most important. Yeast consume sugar, that sugar is coming from the malt, and then they produce as a byproduct of their consumption of the sugar, alcohol, CO2, and tons of flavors. Over 500 potential flavor compounds uh, have been assigned to yeast during fermentation. And these flavors can range from banana, clove, uh, pineapple, peach, uh, to things like um, a barnyard, horse poop, horse blanket, pig poop sort of characteristics. Uh, and, and since they have that wide range, it's important to pay attention to what yeast want and what they need and how we can sort of um, create the best environment for them to give us the type of results we want for that particular beer style. So... Here is a yeast uh, cell that is uh, growing. Um, you see on the right side of that picture, that's a mother cell, and on the left side, that's what we call a daughter cell. And uh, on the top right of the mother cell, you see these three little bumps. Those are either new cells about to form or they're uh, old bud scars uh, from previous daughters being um, formed. And those bud scars, uh, you, you can imagine that's kind of causing some damage to the cell. And if that cell gets damaged too much, it inhibits the yeast's ability to take in nutrients and food and uh, limits the yeast's ability to create ethanol, CO2, etc. So we don't want to overwork our yeast and we want them to be very strong and healthy. So it's really important that we take care and we take note of how much yeast we're adding to our beer and we take um, extra steps to add nutrients, minerals to, uh, for the yeast, and uh, really good aeration because they use oxygen to form strong cell walls. So if they have to make complete copies of themselves, we want them to have enough available nutrients in the wort to do that. So we'll talk about that in the process, but uh, I want to just really make it clear that fermentation and yeast health really is the key to making really good, exceptional, high quality, uh, consistent beer. So the more you learn about yeast, uh, the farther your dollar will be stretched as compared to, say, um, learning about all grain brewing. So if you're a partial grain or beginning brewer cooking uh, your beer in your kitchen on the stove and you feel the urge to go towards uh, all grain brewing, I would first ask yourself, what do I know about yeast and what am I doing to provide them the best environment uh, to make the beer the way I want them to make it. Uh, really think of them as like you're building a house called beer and you're hiring your contractor and your subcontractor, excuse me, subcontractors, etc. cetera. Um, if you want your house to be built uh, with two people, uh, but if it really needs to be built with a hundred people on the job, just think of yeast as the people that you're adding there. So uh, the quality of, of their health and, and the number of, of the yeast is really important. And we have a lot of choice with yeast. Um, we can have, uh, we could choose between yeast uh, species that are uh, 
that are fermenters um, that create kind of more of like a clean sort of profile. So like if we're making a pale ale or an IPA or a porter or a stout, we may not want a lot of uh, yeast flavor or impact. So we would choose strains like the California Ale strain from White Labs or, or similar. Uh, but if we are making a style like a Saison or a Hefeweizen or a Belgian Triple, a lot of the flavor profile of those beers does come from the yeast and selecting the appropriate yeast and then treating that particular yeast in the way it likes to be treated will, uh, will in the end play a huge role in, in helping you create the beer style that you wanted to create. All right. Uh, water is Ringo Starr. Why? Because he's the best drummer of all time. And I mean it. Uh, I get a lot of flack for that one. Usually, this is usually in a, in a live class where people go like, oh, what about, you know, so-and-so or, you know, on and on. And I agree, those are all great uh, drummers. What I mean here, though, is one of the great uh, features of Ringo Starr is that uh, it's all, his style was just ten, tended to be very clean and consistent, and uh, a lot of his flair was sort of kept to very subtle little nuances throughout. And those subtle little nuances uh, tended to just help uh, support the role of the other members of the band. So in that sense of the word, uh, uh, of a good drummer, he was he was one of the greatest because he he knew how to stay in the pocket, as they say. And water has this very similar role here. Uh, if we want to make good tasting beer, we should start with good tasting water. Uh, what does that mean? It means if if you drink your water and it tastes really funky and weird, your beer is probably going to continue to carry on those pretty funky and weird profiles. If you taste your water and it tastes nice and clean, then you have a really nice good foundation for your malt profile and your yeast and your hot profile to do what they would like to do. And we can actually influence the, uh, the impact of the uh, profile of the beer. I'm sorry. We can actually influence the perception of like the yeast character, the malt character, and the hop character based on the types of minerals that are in, in the water. So uh, this is some anecdotal evidence that, that kind of illustrates that. When we look at mineral lower mineral content, um, it tends to be really good uh, for making lighter, cleaner styles like German Pilsner or, or Helles or Bohemian Pilsner. Um, and when we look at higher mineral content, uh, it tends to accentuate either hoppy characteristics or malty characteristics, so things like uh, Irish Stout uh, or uh, the water in San Diego where Stone IPA and so many other great IPAs came from tend to be pretty high in mineral content. And that mineral content tends to accentuate the hop bitterness and the hop character of the beer. So we have this anecdotal evidence that really illustrates that uh, certain beer styles did come from certain types of water profiles. Now, what kind of water should I use? Um, you should just use what tastes good and what's, what's easily available. If you have a, a store nearby where they can fill up those large jugs uh, of water for you, it's worth going there and giving it a try. Uh, or just grab some um, kind of spring water. Uh, or if you have a filter, uh, you can uh, run it through like a carbon filter. Uh, my suggestion starting out is just go grab gallon jugs of water, uh, in part because we're going to put some of those gallons of jugs of water in the freezer to help them uh, get cool, and I'll talk about that later. Uh, but just make sure it tastes good. If you smell swimming pool chlorine in your glass of water, I probably wouldn't use it, and I would definitely look into either um, uh, Camden tablets or other uh, things we can use to clean up the water, and I'm happy to touch more on that if you have questions about it. And a quick slide on adjuncts. Uh, so adjuncts, we call the fifth beetle. This would be um, anything that's not Paul, John, George, or Ringo. Uh, so this would be uh, things like honey or orange peel or uh, flaked, um, flaked corn, what, what have you. Uh, so adjuncts slash additives uh, are kind of everything else um, that, uh, depending on the style of beer, may or may not be required to do that style um, kind of to spec, so to speak. All right, so we're going to take a quick little break. And by this, uh, really, I mean, I'm just going to uh, give you guys some time to, if you need to get up, go to the restroom, that sort of thing, go for it. Uh, and then I will look to see if there's any questions in the, in the comments. And if you haven't uh, added any questions or comments there and you, and you have something that's on your mind that you want a little clarification on, uh, please feel free to add it there. And uh, we'll look at that. And then, uh, you know, three to four minutes or so, 
uh, we'll just move into the actual brewing process. So this is kind of the, the first two thirds of the class was just covering ingredients and now we're gonna go into a quick slideshow of just the process for making beer at home. Also a good time to take a sip of beer. Cheers. So from Sean, we have a good question. Is it common practice to use more than one yeast in a brew or a most beer brewed with just one strain of yeast? Uh, that one is a, is a good question because it, it really depends. Generally speaking, if you're looking at um, a brewery that is making like pale ale, a porter, a stout, uh, they're probably using the same yeast strain for most of those, uh, in part because they're, it is easier to just, um, if you're a large facility, it's easier to maintain one yeast strain because that yeast strain needs to be kind of fed over time and it needs to be kind of consistently used in order to get the best results from it. And, excuse me, but, um, and also we can manipulate one style of yeast to behave differently based on temperature or how much of that yeast we add. Uh, so it, even if we're using a house, a house strain that tends to be pretty neutral and clean, if we wanted to make uh, an English style that tends to have a little bit more fruity yeast character, we can either uh, under pitch that yeast or ferment that yeast at a warmer temperature in order to sort of augment the flavor profile so that we can make it just, we can make the same style of yeast feel a little bit different in the beer. When it comes to wanting to use multiple types of yeast, Typically, you'll see people do that when they're working with Belgian styles. And the reason you might want to do that would be either to increase the amount of complexity that the yeast create during fermentation. So a Saison strain can uh, be known for either creating like really fruity sort of profiles, like bubblegum, a little bit of banana, pear, and peach. But then some Saison strains tend to accentuate the more pepper um, side of the, the, the world. So... By combining those two strains together, you might find a nice middle ground. Uh, but you can also take the approach of uh, doing sort of a 50-50, so equal parts of each yeast, or like a 75% of the more peppery one with a 25% of the more fruity one. And uh, the yeast basically that has the most access to the food uh, will be the yeast that um, ends up having a greater influence on the profile. Uh, the last example I'll, I'll, I'll bring up is, again, with Saisons, there are some strains, um, whether it's a Saison strain or even some lager strains, uh, that do tend to ferment really well for like three or four days, and then they just sort of stall. And then like a week later, they just start fermenting again. And uh, it just seems to be a characteristic with certain strains that uh, it's just kind of the way they roll, and that's how they behave. So some brewers will make up for that, uh, especially if you're on a deadline or a schedule or especially in a production facility uh, where you need your beers to come out on a more predictable uh, pace than just like when the yeast feels like it. Um, there are some instances where brewers will use 75% Saison yeast to give most of the character that they want for that Saison style. And then they'll also add about 25% of a really clean, uh, more efficient uh, ale strain uh, that will just help kind of finish the job. So that Saison strain has more opportunity to eat more food, so they will dominate the flavor profile, but then that uh, when they kind of take a nap, that other yeast strain will continue to keep going and just help finish the beer in a timely manner. And uh, the beer I'm drinking right now is uh, Bird Park from uh, North Park Brewing Co. Good Bohemian Pilsner. So very nice, kind of more malt leaning, more or less, but um, uh, still has a nice, solid, like spicy, old school, old European vibe of uh, hop profile. All right, so I'm going to keep going into uh, the brewing process. Um, this next part of the of the course tends to move a little bit more. I'm going to just show some slides on, um, oops, that's not how I do that, uh, on uh, kind of the breakdown of the brewing process that you would see at home. 
I want to emphasize that um, there's no like absolutely wrong, wrong or absolutely right way to brew beer. Uh, so again, no matter what you do, the general process is you steep some grains, you boil that wort, and then you cool it down to room temperature and you add your yeast. Uh, that's always going to be the process like I mentioned earlier. Um, I'm going to walk through a general process that I think works pretty well and that's pretty, a, pretty easy to just try your first time. And then from there, feel free to um, adapt or add or do whatever you, you want to do in a way that suits your, your practice or uh, your household. So if it's stuff that you already have at home that you would like to incorporate uh, or if you're trying to control costs or if you're trying to just like, go big, there's so many ways you can, you can adjust and adapt this. So uh, that's why we're here at Home Brewing Co. to answer those sort of questions. So uh, feel free to ask here or shoot us an email, brew at homebrewingco.com and uh, we'll, we'll help you. All right, so here's a sample recipe. This is uh, an American Pale Ale. This uh, recipe we're pulling from the Brewing Classic Styles book by Jamil Zanishef and uh, John Palmer, uh, two of uh, probably the, the more influential uh, beer homebrew writers in the, uh, in the world, really. And uh, this is a great collection of just really good standard um, recipes, so we, we reference it pretty often. But we'll see here, 5.5 pounds of dry malt extract, a half pound of caramel 60, WLP, uh, which is White Labs, uh, 001, their California ale yeast, probably one of the most common yeast strains used in the homebrew world and in the uh, brewing world at large. A half ounce of Horizon hops for bittering, a half ounce of Cascade plus a half ounce of Centennial for aroma, and a half ounce of Cascade and another half ounce of Centennial for aroma again. Now, what is this 60, 10, 10, 0, 0, what the hell is that? Uh, these are, uh, this is a standard nomenclature that brewers use to describe when they are going to add the hops. And what this 60 is referring to is uh, 60 minutes before the end of the boil. So a typical brew day is going to include boiling for 60 minutes. So this means that as soon as you see that boil happening, you can then add in those 60 minute addition of Horizon. With 10 minutes remaining in the boil, you can add this half ounce of Cascade. And with zero minutes remaining in the boil, so in other words, when you turn off the flame or in the boil, you can add in those cascade. The effect of doing this means that the longer your hops boil, the more bitterness you will extract from your hops. So if these uh, 60 minute horizons are gonna provide a lot of bittering, that's why we call them our bittering addition. And then these uh, 10 minute and zero minute additions uh, will provide less bitterness and at the same time, will not burn off as much of the more delicate and more volatile uh, aromas and flavors. So the 60 minutes of hops will tend to just contribute bitterness, not a lot of flavor and aroma because they're the, those, uh, those oils that provide flavor and aroma are really delicate. So they'll just be kind of driven off and it'll just evaporate with the steam during the boil. These ones added at 10 and especially these ones added at zero, will be like uh, preserving that nice softer nuance there. And then we need six to seven gallons of clean water. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, you can use spring water, filter tap, you can use reverse osmosis water, that's uh, perfectly fine. Uh, distilled water is also great. Um, I will just say uh, without going too far into it that distilled water and reverse osmosis water tend to be very uh, void of nutrients so if you're doing all grain brewing, you do want to add minerals and nutrients back into the water, really minerals like calcium chloride, calcium sulfate. Uh, if you're doing extract brewing, uh, you're probably safe to just use those. Even if you're doing all grain brewing, you're probably safe to just use those. But generally speaking, you will find people suggest that you should add minerals back into it. Not a lot. Um, but if you, if you want more advice or guidance on that, um, happy to help. The reason I'm not spending, there's a reason why I'm not having a whole like two or three slides on that here. It's because yes, it does matter. Yes, it does make an impact, but no, it will not ruin your, your brew. So, uh, if it's something you want to get into, get into it. If it's something you don't want to get into, 
maybe just buy spring water because you know there's minerals and nutrients in there uh, and, and just leave it at that. And I promise you it'll be perfectly fine. So don't confuse precision with accuracy. They are different things. Um, all you need to do is make a tasty beer and any of these options will do it. So tangent ended. All right. Here's the brew day timeline. So we're going to go from this like zero to 15 minutes. Uh, so if you look at that top left there, it's kind of small, uh, but it says prep. And then uh, this whole timeline goes through like a three hour day. That's a pretty optimistic uh, brew day. This is like if I have everything in place and I've really prepped and, and I'm very confident in my process, um, I can wrap up my brew day in, in three hours. The first time I brewed a beer, I had read all the books, I had read all these forums, I felt like I kind of taken in a lot of information, but I was still very unfamiliar with like when and what and where and why. Uh, so on br that first brew day, I like really overthought everything, which uh, anybody who knows me would say, oh, that sounds like about right, like you overthought everything. But uh, so I'm here to say you don't need to overthink everything. You can just follow the steps in the process, just like you're making cookies or something. Uh, don't ask yourself, why am I adding hops right now? So you save the existential crisis for before and after brew day. And I promise that um, uh, the brew day can go pretty smooth and clean. And then once you get that first one under your belt, the process will seem so easy and basic for you. And you can sort of add on to it from there. So uh, that said, for your first brew day, I would try to schedule yourself, you know, four or five hours just to kind of get everything ready and then clean up and everything. These days, three hours, I can definitely finish a, a partial grain batch of beer. No problem. All right, so prep. Uh, so the first thing I like to do is uh, either like the night before, if I'm going to wake up really early to brew, or um, really in the early in the morning if I'm going to do like a 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. sort of start time. Uh, I like to get some water uh, in these one-gallon jugs and put it in the freezer. I'll put like four gallons in the freezer. And my goal in my freezer, if I if I have water in there for like four to five hours, it'll turn kind of like slushy, uh, slurpy consistency, and that's perfect. So uh, I'm gonna put that in there, I'm gonna use that later. And then when I'm ready to start brewing, I'm gonna put two and a half gallons, this is a five gallon pot that I have here, I'm gonna heat it up to about 160 degrees Fahrenheit. You might see like 150 or 155 Fahrenheit, uh, anywhere in that 150 to 160 range will do the job. While I'm waiting for that to come up to uh, its temperature, I'm going to prepare everything else I need. So I'm going to uh, fill up a large bowl or a bucket with some sanitizer, or I'll plug up my sink and fill it up with some sanitizer. And I just like having this pool of sanitizer around that I can either kind of rinse my hands in or I can always have it ready to rinse my instruments in. Uh, but then I'll also start uh, measuring out my grain or my my, my hops and uh, other things like that and putting them into small bowls so I'm kind of ready to go like cooking channel style. All right, my water got up to 160 degrees so now I'm going to add my steeping grains. Uh, the, the, the typical thing you'll hear is uh, is 30 minutes but you know 15 to 30 minutes is, is, is pretty good. Um, it's probably like, you know, do you steep your tea bag for three minutes or do you let it go for 10 minutes? Um, it's probably a bad example because yes, you will notice more harsh characteristic in your tea. But, um, the point being that, you know, 15 to 30 minutes, you're probably fine. Uh, any time around there is, is great. Uh, we're going to keep the temp around 155 Fahrenheit. So I have a little thermometer that I keep floating in there to keep an eye on. If I do need to bring up the temp a little bit, I'll use really low heat so that I don't overshoot it. Uh, and I'll uh, feel free to gently stir or kind of like dunk the, the bag of grains uh, just to sort of help keep the temperature stable. After that uh, time, whether it was 15 or whether it was 30 minutes, I will uh, remove the grain bag and then it's now time to just bring that heat to maximum and bring that up to a boil. So uh, if you're at sea level like I am here in San Diego, your water will boil at 212 degrees. If you're at higher sea levels, um, so if you're up in Denver, your water's going to boil at a slightly different temperature, but uh, you know what a boil looks like. We're looking for a nice gentle rolling boil. Uh, I like to just add the extract while I'm waiting for it to come to a boil. Um, that just gives me something to do kind of in the meantime, and it's not going to really impact anything. Uh, 
but I do make sure that I'm stirring it well and that I'm uh, preventing uh, any liquid or dry malt extract from sticking to the bottom. Uh, I do know that my recipe here said dry malt extract, but these photos are using some liquid malt extract. I just wanted to show you what that could look like. You can see it's really sticky molasses sort of thing. All right, so I'm just kind of waiting now. Uh, my, my stove will probably take me 10 to 15 minutes to get up to a boil, so I'm just kind of sitting around and I'm, I'm waiting to avoid the boil over. So that's when uh, all the protein in the grain starts to expand and expand and it turns into this foam, and that foam threatens to overflow out of my pot and create a sticky mess on my, on my nice clean stove. Uh, so if I leave a spoon resting over the top or if I have a spray bottle with some water, I can sort of douse uh, that foam and kind of keep it under control. Uh, same thing as when you're making spaghetti. Uh, yeah, that foam that kind of builds up and you have to watch out. Uh, so avoid that boil over. And then I'm going to uh, add hops and nutrients just depending on the, on the schedule. So this recipe called for um, some horizon hops to be added at the beginning of the boil. So I'll add those hops at the beginning and I'll just follow the recipe. And if it tells me to uh, add hops at 10 minutes, then with 10 minutes left in the boil, that's when I add those hops. Now, nutrients and uh, clarifiers such as Irish moss, which is a popular uh, clarifier, uh, I like to add those in at, at about the 10 minute mark. So uh, I can add those in when I add in my, uh, my hops or whenever I feel like it within that 10 minute mark. This recipe didn't call for any honey or anything like that, but you might find recipes that call for, for that during the boil. Sometimes you add it after. Uh, that really just depends on what you're, what you're trying to do. Excuse me, take a sip. <laughs> All right, so uh, after 60 minutes of boiling, uh, we added our hops, so we have our hop flavor in there. Great, everything's looking good. We now need to add the yeast, but yeast will definitely die if we add it to boiling wort. So, uh, we now need to cool this wort down to room temperature. So the common way that um, you'll, the kind of the first tip you'll see when you're looking at how to brew will be to create an ice bath. Um, so for me, I you know, filled up my, my sink for the first time with ice and water and I just stuck my kettle in there. Uh, and if you do some gently, gentle stirring with a sanitized spoon, that'll help um, cool it down a little faster. You definitely want to keep any like bugs or insects or pets or whatever uh, from contaminating that wort. Uh, so you do have to be careful. Um, and it, I found that uh, my ice melted pretty quickly and then I had a really hard time getting it to go from 120 Fahrenheit down to the room temp of like 70 Fahrenheit that I needed. So I just kind of had to wait and then go buy more ice and then wait. Uh, another method is to buy a wort chiller. This is a copper coil that you pump water through the coil and it'll help cool it down. They're pretty effective. Um, but uh, for your first brews, I don't really recommend them if you're just doing this method of uh, what we call a partial boil where we're uh, going to boil about half of our wort um, or half of the liquid uh, and then just top off with water. Uh, so since I know I'm using cold water to top this off to the five gallon mark anyway. Since I had that water in the freezer to begin with, if I top it off with nice cold, nearly frozen water, it is going to basically drop the temp down to where I need it. So uh, that's my little tip for that. And so we cool it down using either of those methods. And now here I'm using a little uh, auto siphon in that top, top left. Auto siphon is a device that allows you to start the flow of a siphon or a vacuum from, uh, which will help you move liquid from your kettle to your bucket or carboy fermenter. Uh, so this has been sanitized already in my sanitizer bucket. I've already pumped sanitizer through it and then drained it. Uh, so I'm transferring that from the, from the kettle into my carboy. And then I'm going to top off my carboy or my bucket to the five gallon mark. Uh, I actually like to go to the five and a half gallon mark um, you'll find that a lot of the recipes are written for five and a half gallons so that um, any sediment or anything like that um, won't take away from your final volume. Uh, and then I shake the, the vessel really, really well. So this is the beginning method of uh, how, how people will aerate their wort, and it really just involves literally just shaking your carboy or your bucket. 
And you, if you're doing that method, um, you need to go for 10 minutes. And, it, and 10 minutes takes a really long time when you're just shaking something. So uh, one of the first kind of gadgets I recommend you looking into is buying an aeration stone and using either an aeration pump with the filter or uh, the, the little oxygen tanks with the filter um, to help you achieve the oxygen level you need. The reason why I recommend that gadget is, like I mentioned before, yeast health is really one of the main keys to making really good, great beer. And oxygen is used in cell replication uh, to make really nice, strong cell walls. So we want that for the yeast. So uh, that's, that's 30 to 50 bucks you can spend on making your yeast happy forever. So I, I really recommend it. If you, if you don't do that, uh, if, you don't, if you don't want to spend the, the cash on it, don't, don't worry about that. But just know that uh, in order to achieve the ideal level of oxygen, you do need to shake that for 10 minutes. And I mean 10 minutes. So after that, we add our yeast. Pitch is a term that you're going to use uh, or hear quite a lot for like, oh, what, what temperature did you pitch your yeast at? Uh, that's just another way of saying add yeast. Now, uh, Actually, before you do add your yeast, this slide I kind of had to add a little later on because I, I was like, oh shoot, I need to say really before you add your yeast, you should take your gravity reading. But here, here's just a slide on gravity readings in general. So um, gravity is uh, a word we use to describe the density of a liquid. So if I take a hydrometer, which is uh, a device that measures the density of, of a liquid, and if I add it to a jar that's full of water, uh, the hydrometer will float at a mark that says about 1.0111. Uh, now, if I add a bunch of sugar to it, which wort does have a good amount of sugar in it, uh, the density of the liquid will increase, and I can use the hydrometer to tell me how much sugar is in this wort. And by that, uh, by taking that measurement, I have a good guess of about how much alcohol I will achieve during fermentation. And the hydrometer at the end of fermentation will give you a much lower reading so that the picture on the right hand side shows a reading of about 1.0. You can see there's a 10 line right there and, and there's a few more notches. So that's probably about 1.014. So that's a pretty nice um, finishing gravity for a beer. You'll, you'll get used to seeing these numbers and knowing uh, that sounds like an original gravity versus that sounds like a final gravity. And to get used to that, I just recommend you look at recipes and you start to just kind of see, um, okay, that that number is about normal for a pale ale, that number is about normal for a stout, etc. Uh, but we want to remember to take this gravity reading um, either before we add the yeast or, if, hey, I've forgotten in the past and I just end up uh, taking the reading right after I add the yeast. It's not going to throw off your reading. Uh, but you do want to uh, do, your, do your job to keep things uh, sanitary. So we're going to take that gravity reading and we're just going to write it down. Our OG is our original gravity and our FG is our final gravity. Um, I will admit that this, this does seem to be the thing that um, tends to be one of those steps that might be harder to remember to add into your process. So don't, don't fret or freak out if you, if you forget. Uh, it's just a good habit to get into, so um, take that time to sort of remind yourself to do it. Uh, luckily, when we're using extracts, the original gravity is going to be pretty consistent. If we're doing all grain brewing, we're in charge of making our own sugars. So uh, we want to make sure that we, we have a good habit of verifying what our original gravity is. Alrighty. So during fermentation, you're going to see a few things, and I want to throw some terms at you. Uh, you're going to see this layer of foam at the top. And it looks pretty gross. It's pretty funky. Uh, and it looks like something is going terribly wrong. But that is actually a fantastic sign of good fermentation. We call it the croissant. And it's just a bunch of um, yeast bits and CO2 and hop bits that are being pushed up uh, during fermentation because the, uh, the yeast is creating a lot of CO2. So this is actually a good sign uh, that everything's going well. The croissant can get a little out of control uh, so you can see here it's uh, coming out of this little airlock that we have at the top of the carboy to allow air to get out. Um, so you could use a blow-off tube or there is a product called Firm Cap that I, I do highly recommend. It's a food-grade silicone, a couple drops of that. It's very inexpensive and it'll help uh, keep your, uh, firm, your 
your croissant under control. Our recipe did not call for any dry hop, but I just have it here just to kind of give you the general sense of uh, usually if you are going to dry hop or add hops to your fermenting vessel, uh, you would do that three to seven days before bottling. And again, the longer contact time, the more hop characteristic you would expect to get. Uh, but eventually you will get some grassy character, especially if you go, uh, well, if you go more um, past the like seven or really like 10 day mark, you might get some grassy character for better or for worse. Just depends what you're trying to do. Another tip, I do recommend that you use a shirt to protect uh, your fermentation from the light. Uh, this will help keep things um, fresh tasting and, and free of skunky flavors and aromas. So we're pretty much wrapping up the, the brew day. So uh, brew day is done. Uh, so that was our kind of zero to three hour mark. And uh, if you if you like these slides, I can uh, just reach out to me and I'll, I'll give you that link. Actually, I'll put the link in the video here. Um, the uh, one of the things that you'll constantly hear is that uh, fermentation is really the key to good, good beer making. I've said it a few times already today. Uh, one of those key elements is temperature control. And on the more expensive sort of out of reach side of that is buying a, a small fridge and putting a temperature controller on the fridge so that you can maintain 65 to 72 degrees, depending on what you're trying to make. Um, or if you're making a lager, maybe you want to keep it at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and that'll play a huge role in how your how your beer turns out, especially during the first four to six days. So if uh, if buying a little fridge and taking up the space doesn't sound something that you would like to try, here's just some easy things you can do. Uh, a damp t-shirt, especially if uh, you have a little saucer at the bottom there to collect some moisture. So like a, like a you can get like a cheap plant tray from from a uh, garden store, for instance, or like a trash can lid upside down. You can fill it with water, put a little t-shirt over the top of that, and the t-shirt will wick up the, the water, and as it evaporates, it'll carry away a couple of degrees of, of, of heat with it. Or you could do a really large water bath like that in that middle picture to help um, uh, just create uh, like a larger thermal mass that won't be able to kind of go through those temperature fluctuations, say if it's in your, in your shed or your garage where it, the temperature swing might, might go above 10 degrees in a day. Uh, now, if you combine all of those things together, uh, like and add a little small fan to that, you kind of create this swamp cooler. And so now, for for the cost of a couple gallons of water, a t-shirt, and a little four or five dollar fan, uh, you can you can do some um, uh, pretty effective methods for for keeping your temperature under control. Uh, I also like during the during the really hot months. Uh, I just freeze some water bottles or ice packs, whatever you want, and I just kind of swap those out with the for the first few days and, and try to keep my temperature around whatever it is I'm shooting for, usually 67 to 70 degrees. Uh, if that sounds like a pain in the butt, don't worry. It's really the first four to six days. That's really when a lot of that uh, uh, character comes in. So this is something that like in the morning before you go to work, you can just check on and swap out a frozen water bottle and not spend too much time on it. All right, bottling day. Uh, so after two weeks, you have beer, but it's flat beer. And uh, it's beer that's in a large bucket that uh, isn't really easy for just you know drinking, right? So we need to get it into a smaller vessel. Uh, bottles are the easiest thing to fill when you're first starting. They require the, the least amount of equipment. All you really need is a bottle capper and some clean bottles that you've sanitized. So uh, we also have to deal with this carbonation fact, right? Like I said, this is flat beer we have now. So we move our, uh, or gently rack our, um, our beer into a, a bottling bucket. This is something that just has a spigot on there. Um, ideally with some tubing going to the bottom of the, of the bottle or the thing called a bottle filler. And we prepare some priming sugar, which is just a little bit more food for our yeast. So they're going to eat this sugar, uh, when we feed it to them and they're going to create some more CO2 but just a little bit, four or five ounces of sugar, just enough to create the carbonation level that we expect for beer. So prep some priming sugar, sanitize all of your bottles, get them ready. Uh, they make these things called bottle trees, which you can uh, hang your bottles on that will uh, help them dry out. Uh, use a non-rinse sanitizer like Star Sand or Iodine. 
and then move your beer into a bottling bucket. And then you really just fill cap and then put them in a, in a cool room temperature, ideally dark place for two weeks. And after that two week mark, uh, you'll notice the yeast had consumed that sugar that you gave them, created a little bit more CO2, and that CO2 was captured by the bottle cap and then basically naturally carbonated your beer. Uh, so that is uh, bottling day. It's, it's nice to have a cup, uh, one person extra with you so that one person can fill and the, and the other person can cap bottles and clean bottles and um, kind of keep that process nice and smooth. So um, that will wrap it up. I will look at your questions, comments there um, to um, address anything that came up in the class. But if you're looking for where to go from here, I say join a homebrew club. Uh, I have one image there that is the uh, the Quaff Homebrew Club. That is San Diego's largest, um, oldest homebrew club. Uh, but there are other great clubs in San Diego to check out, depending on where you live. Uh, there's this uh, Society of Barley Engineers up north. There's Mash Heads, which, which meets kind of in the more central part of uh, the county. Uh, but they're all fantastic groups. You'll find a lot of people join multiple clubs. Really fun. It's honestly the best way to... Uh, just like inject the the wealth of knowledge from experienced home brewers uh, into your into your hobby, and you'll find that uh, everyone o o welcomes you with open arms when you join a homebrew club. So get into it. Uh, there's also programs like the SDSU Business of Craft Beer you can look into. That's more of a business program than it is like a brewing program. Uh, eventually down the road, there are uh, schools like UC Davis that do more of a uh, brewing science technology course. There's uh, tons of options these days, but just wanted to th tell you to keep learning, really. Uh, my favorite book would be John Palmer's How to Brew. I really love reading uh, The Complete Joy of Charlie Papazian. If you look in the comments earlier, uh, J-Rod, he mentioned, uh, relax, don't worry, have a homebrew. That's the mantra of, of the homebrew world, and that comes from this book by Charlie Papazian who is uh, one of the founders of the American Home Brewers Association. Uh, I like home, uh, how to brew in particular, just the way it's organized. I, I find that it's really easy to find things through the index. Um, so this is a book that uh, literally every year I tend to just sort of flip through it and, and reacquaint myself with a lot of the, the terms and practices. Um, but it's also the first book that I ever read. Uh, so that means that it's a great book that introduces you to the basic concept, concepts that you need to know, but it's also a book that dives pretty deep into some of the more advanced topics, so something that I, I constantly refer to. Uh, and there's also just some really fun, uh, great books, like Randy Mosher has written some fantastic books, uh, a few in addition to these two that I have here, but Tasting Beer is sort of like the Cicerone BJCP 101, and that's the Beer Judge sort of for certification program, but I also recommend these, these books here. Um, I'm just a, a huge fan of books in general, so uh, there's there's plenty out there. Brewer's Publication uh, would probably be the uh, the website to check out. Basically, any of their books uh, on on brewing will will be a good place to start. Um, and uh, that's that is that. So thank you so much for being a part of my first live stream. Uh, this is a record for me. I think I kept my mouth um, pretty pretty. Uh, I prevented it from running on way too too long like I tend to do. But uh, I am going to take a look at any of your questions, guys. It doesn't seem like there's many questions here. So if you have anything, I'll just kind of stick around for a little bit and uh, happy to answer them. But I hope I hope you got something out of this. And uh, if you want to email us at brew at homebrewingco.com, uh, you can uh, get more questions uh, answered from us there. Uh, also, go to homebrewingco.com. Check out our resources page. We've been working on adding a lot more uh, to that. So uh, as of now, we have a handful of videos on how to use an auto siphon, how to use a hydrometer, that sort of stuff. Um, and feel free to just let us know if there's stuff that you would like to see videos on. Uh, that's uh, what we'd like to dedicate a lot of our time to. So um, thanks again, and cheers. Happy, happy National Learn to Homebrew Day and take care of yourselves and hope you're all doing well. Bye, cheers.